Let's take a look at this GPS receiver. We'll consider some general concepts about GPS and then take a look at a detailed example of pulling out information from this receiver. This is the Digilent PMOD GPS. It's based on this product from Global Top, a self-contained GPS module. The module in turn is based on the MediaTek MT3329 chipset. Let's begin with a quick overview of general GPS concepts. This is an acronym that stands for Global Positioning System, and this system has 24 active satellites distributed equally about the Earth at orbits of about 19,000 kilometers. Each satellite completes two passes around the Earth every day, and at least four satellites are in view from every location on Earth. Each satellite transmits its position and current time with atomic clock accuracy, and the receiver measures the time of flight of the signal to determine its own distance to each satellite. From there, trilateration is used to determine the receiver's location. Trilateration is most easily understood from a two-dimensional example with a map, and then we can promote that to three dimensions in a moment. Now, you have a map. You know you're somewhere on the map, but you have no idea where. Imagine that a helpful person approaches you and says, you are 1,855 kilometers from San Diego, California. You look to your map, find San Diego, trace out a circle of radius 1855 kilometers, and now you know that you're anywhere on this circle. Could be out in the ocean, could be in Mexico, anywhere. Second person walks up and says, you are 1,216 kilometers from Mexico City. Now you trace out that radius, 1216 kilometers. Now we're getting somewhere. That means that you must be in one of two places, either out in the ocean or somewhere in Texas. Now a third person walks up and says, you are 1489 kilometers from Indianapolis, Indiana. Looks like it's right here. Let me draw the circle. And now we have enough information to uniquely determine our own location. That would be right here. The intersection of all three circles looks like it's in the vicinity of Austin, Texas, which is the global headquarters of National Instruments. Note that you needed at least three measurements. And when you promote this to three dimensions with GPS, you're working with spheres instead of circles, and you would need at least four measurements. Although it turns out you can get by with only three satellites in view by ignoring what amounts to the second intersection out in space. Of course, GPS receivers are very common now. You can find them in all sorts of mobile devices. Applications include navigation and mapping, and also measuring the distance between different locations on the planet. Taking a look at the Global Top product features, again, that's the device right there. It has an integrated patch antenna, and it also supports an external antenna, and that would be connected right here on the PMOD GPS board. Please see the reference manual for the PMOD GPS for details. You can get 1 hertz to 10 hertz update rates, and it generates NMEA sentences. That's an abbreviation for National Marine Electronics Association. These are ASCII text strings, and it works through a UART interface at 9600 baud, 8 bits, and one stop bit. There's also an output called the one pulse per second output. This indicates that you have valid data from the satellites. There's also another signal called the 2D or 3D fix output, and that also indicates whether or not you have a sufficient number of satellites in view for a good measurement. There's a reset input, and battery backup for this device is possible. The battery is helpful because for a cold start, it can take anywhere from 30 seconds to a minute or more until you start getting valid data out of it. For a hot start with battery backup, it's ready to go in about three to five seconds. The supply voltage is three volts to 3.6 volts. The manual does suggest that you want to control your uh, ripple voltage to better than 50 millivolts peak to peak. Well, let's take a look at the pins for the PMOD GPS, but before I do that, I want to flip the board to its back side and we can see the 
container for a 12 and a half millimeter coin cell. That's the one for battery backup. Also wanted to mention that the PMOD GPS in general, when it's active, draws between 24 and 30 milliamps. Take a look at the details of the pins. To begin with, we have the power supply connections. That's your power and ground. Here we have the UART connections. We have the UART receiver, RXD, that's the input, and the UART transmitter, TXD, that would be the output from this board. Here's the one pulse per second signal. Here we have the 2D and 3D fix. This remains low when you have valid data, and then it begins to toggle high and low once each second when it's acquiring satellite fixes. This signal is also connected to this onboard LED, so that provides a useful indicator when the board is looking for satellites. Here we have the reset, and you drive that low, and that's the same thing as power cycling the board. Now, the primary output of the GPS receiver is in the form of NMEA sentences. It emits a cluster of sentences once every second. I've added some line breaks here to separate the clusters, but those line breaks are not normally part of the output. As you look at the details of each one of these lines, that is each sentence, you see that it begins with a dollar sign and it's followed by five characters. First two characters are called the talker ID, GP for GPS. Then we have three characters to designate the message type. And as we look at these clusters, typically they contain four types of messages, and then occasionally it will emit a fifth type of message here. So the five types of messages that are potentially emitted are GGA for GPS fixed data, GSA, which indicates essentially the precision that you have in your measurement as well as active satellites, GSV is GPS satellites in view, RMC is recommended minimum navigation data, and VTG stands for track made good and ground speed. As you look at the remainder of the sentence, you see fields separated by commas. Each data field is delimited by a comma. In this case, Sometimes we see strings with numbers, sometimes with letters. Occasionally you see nothing between the commas. And it is possible to have null data fields. The asterisk is the last special delimiter, and that indicates that the following two characters are the checksum at the end of the sentence. The checksum is the exclusive or of all the ASCII bytes in the sentence, excluding the dollar sign. And this is used for error detection, just to make sure that the sentence you received is good. Each sentence ends with a carriage return character and then a line feed character. Please consult these references to get more details on all NMEA sentences. I'll be focusing in this example on the RMC sentence, and I'll specifically extract this one right here. All right, here's the sentence, and I've isolated the various fields, and let's see what we have. First thing is the time code. Status tells you whether or not the measurements are valid. Here we have the latitude and longitude information, speed over ground, course over ground, today's date, information about magnetic north variation in your specific location, a mode, and a checksum. Let's look at the time code first. UTC stands for Coordinated Universal Time. The format is hours, minutes, and seconds, with fractional seconds as well. You'll want to add or subtract some number of hours from this value according to your time zone. The status is either an A or a V character. A indicates valid data, and V indicates invalid data. We have the latitude, and the latitude is two characters for degrees, and the remaining characters are in minutes, with whole minutes and then fractional minutes. In this case, we have 22.0225 minutes. 
we have 60 minutes per degree. If you want to convert the whole thing into degrees, you want to divide the minutes by 60 and then add that value to the whole number of degrees. Latitude can be either north or south. Longitude can be either east or west. It's very similar to latitude. The only difference is that we have three characters for degrees. Speed over ground. This is a value in knots. Course over ground. This is a value in degrees between 0 and 360 degrees. 0 degrees points north, and then you work your way around clockwise. So east would be 90, south is 180, and so on. Here's today's date. Format is date, or the day, month, and year. Down here are these two fields associated with magnetic north variation. That requires a firmware upgrade, but that tells you your declination angle, that is the difference between true north and magnetic north at your location. Let's finish up by taking a look at how to parse this sentence in LabVIEW. Here I have one sentence string broken up into an array of fields. I start with the time code. This string is fed into scan from string, which uses this formatting string on top. The formatting string says, find three decimal numbers, each requiring two characters. These become available down here as three integer values. And for example, this is where you can do the math to take care of the time, time zone correction. These three integers are fed into format into string. And with this formatting string up here, we can say, let's print these out using two characters each and connected with colons. Here I'm going to skip the status from index array and move on to latitude. In a similar fashion then, latitude formatting string says I need two characters for a decimal number and six characters for a floating point number. The floating point number would be the minutes. These emerge as both an integer and a floating point number. Do the math to combine into degrees and then print as a formatted number using eight characters total with six characters after the decimal point. The percent %s in the formatting string is where you can also add in the direction, in this case north or south. Longitude is similar, except this one needs a total of nine characters for the field.